I didn't stories. see that. You know, there, there's... There are a few, but not many. The, you look at it all. Yes. You, get, you would come out of it going, did I learn anything? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I learned that uh, uh, Charles Finney was a Presbyterian. I didn't know that. No way. Really? Yeah. That's what it said. He must have started out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's pray together. Our God, we thank you for this day and, and for the opportunity to open your word. And we thank you for the ministry of the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, we are here to better understand his call and his word. Uh, help us, Holy Spirit, guide us and direct us, uh, for we need you. Bless our time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, so Jeremiah, we're into. Uh, Jeremiah grew up in a small town called Anathoth. It's uh, three miles away from uh, Jerusalem. Uh, it was uh, quite a different culture uh, politically from Jerusalem. Jeremiah, interestingly, was born, I didn't know this, was born in the uh, line of Abiathar, the high priest, Abiathar was removed by King Solomon from the high priestly line and, and was replaced by Zadok. Uh, so Jeremiah had a place in terms of his priestly call, but he was um, not accepted by his uh, contemporaries in terms of his priestly call. Uh, people treated him as... as uh, Suspicious, uh, he was disliked, um, and, and, and probably as much disliked for his message as well as, as his uh, background. He was called uh, in his early 20s, in fact his, his life of ministry was over 40 years. So when we read Jeremiah, we need to be careful not to just look at the book in terms of like it was back to back to back to back. These events that transpired uh, took a great deal of time. Uh, we're looking at the era of uh, around 626 BC beginning, and he began with the reign of Josiah. And if you remember the reign of Josiah, uh, he was one king that came in and saw the abuses and neglects of the kings prior and they discovered the scrolls, which were likely the book of Deuteronomy. And, uh, and so he uh, made some wholesale changes in terms of the direction of the, uh, the state of Israel. Um, but his, his work, his prophetic work, um, continued through Josiah and then uh, the evil successor, Jehoahazah, I think I should say it again, Jehoahaz, and then Jehoiakim, and then Jehoiakim, and then Zedekiah. So he had five kings uh, under which he served. It also, his four decades of service also occurred during the uh, diaspora, or the uh, dispersion of the Jews under Nebuchadnezzar in 586. That's when the, the southern kingdom of Judah fell to the Babylonians. Um, we need to recognize that Jeremiah didn't uh, apply for the position of a prophet. Uh, he didn't. Um, he didn't choose it. It was God's choosing of him. And and we can, we think of the major prophets. By the way, what's the difference between a major prophet and a minor prophet? Were the major prophets more important? Yeah, minor and major. <laughs> They're just more voluminous. They just said more things, had more things happen. That's why they're called the major, not the messages are more important or less important. Um, but Jeremiah, we think of Jeremiah and Isaiah, the, the, the two major prophets, right? But you remember Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, where um, he says, um, when, when it's heard, whom shall the Lord send? And what did, what did Isaiah say? No, no, no. 
He didn't say, he said, here am I. Here am I. Send me. That's not Jeremiah. Jeremiah's like, ah, no, I don't want to go. Uh, Jeremiah was a reluctant prophet as compared to Isaiah. But of course, God overrode uh, Jeremiah's uh, his objections. Uh, the, the message of Jeremiah to, to Jeremiah by God was basically, come on, you know, gird your loins, stand up like a man, uh, take, take uh, this uh, call that I'm giving you. Now, I want you to turn, before we get into Jeremiah, to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy 28 should be a um, familiar verse or passage to all of us because we read it during our combination service uh, at the beginning of Lent. And it's the reading of the curses that are promised on a people who do not obey the Lord. And if we pick up at verse 15, Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, we read the curses of disobedience. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the Lord, do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle, offspring. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be. So I guess they'll be cursed. Um, this is if they disobey the Lord. Well, in Jeremiah, this is coming to fruition. These curses are coming to pass. That's the point. So Jeremiah is called to speak to the Israelites um, in terms of when they have come upon these curses that God had promised if they disobey him. I want to say this also. Um, I very much connect to Jeremiah <clears throat> for several reasons that I'll display. But I will say to you this, what I found most interesting in a general overview of Jeremiah. Jeremiah says nothing new. There's no new revelations. He's just bringing to bear the word of God upon the Israelites. This is what God's word means, and this is how you are to apply it in your situation. And it's very much what a preacher needs to be doing. It's very much what a New Testament preacher needs to be doing, preaching the word of God, bringing it to, to bear in the lives of the people of God in their context, in their situation. That's all that Jeremiah does, um, which makes him a little bit unique. He doesn't, he, Isaiah does that a lot, but Isaiah also brings in new revelations, especially when it comes to what the Messiah will be. Jeremiah doesn't do that. Jeremiah doesn't, Jeremiah, the only thing that Jeremiah does that I find uh, is unique is that he talks about what the Father desires and, and what the fire wa Father wants uh, in relationship to his people. But other than that, it, it's, it's simply, here's God's word, here's where you're not obeying it, here's where you need to obey it, and, and, and therefore come to repentance. Also, Jeremiah is very unpopular. Uh, in his day, he's extremely unpopular and, um, and goes against the grain uh, on, on a constant basis and, and is a voice that says, while everyone else is saying, um, you know, everything's great, everything's good, um, let's just keep pressing on. He's saying, no, everything is not good, and, and we need to repent. So uh, that going against the grain, that whole idea of not saying anything new, just bring God's word to bear, I very much uh, relate to. Okay, so let's get into the actual book of Jeremiah. Again, this is right before the exile. Isaiah, Jeremiah. All right, so we're looking at verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, 
the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin. Now, remember Benjamin, uh, the tribe of Benjamin, having its own troubles in Judges, um, one of the smallest tribes of Israel. So, the words of Jeremiah, um, this begins a remarkable collection, again, over 40 years that this book is covering. Well, the meaning of the, the name Jeremiah is actually um, not clear. Uh, there's speculation as to the meaning. Um, one of the meanings is possibly the Lord founds. F-O-U-N-D-S, the Lord founds, the Lord exalts, the Lord throws down. Um, those are some guesses as to the meaning of the name Jeremiah. <clears throat> um, it was actually a common name, interestingly, even though its meaning is not uh, clearly understood. Um, there were actually two Jeremiahs in the mighty men of David, interestingly. Uh, you find that in 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Um, Anathoth, uh, again, since Jeremiah was from the priestly family, it, it made sense that they lived in Anathoth, which was a small village about three miles away from Jerusalem. Um, from the vantage points of Anathoth, one can clearly see that the walls of Jerusalem, I guess, so um, it was a, a city within, within reach of the, of the temple. Verses two and three. To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. He came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of, the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Okay, um, so the book contains the words of Jeremiah, but also, of course, contains the word of the Lord. The prophecy, uh, like all inspired scripture, is both the word of man and the word of God. We, we don't often uh, defend ourselves well enough, as far as Christians, when we talk about whether this is God's word or whether it's man's word. Um, we recognize that just as Jesus was man and God, so we recognize that the scripture is man and God. And we don't differentiate between, well, this is man speaking and this is God speaking. We believe that it's God speaking um, through man. And that even though it, man has his fallible ways, it doesn't mean that it's not inspired. It doesn't mean it's not true. And so we recognize that Jeremiah speaks and so does the Lord speak. Um, in the days of Josiah, King Josiah, again, was one of the better kings of Judah. He was zealous for reform. Um, according to 2 Chronicles 34, it was in the eighth year of Josiah's reign that he sought the Lord, and he, he began an aggressive campaign to purify Israel. Um, God called these two men, Josiah and Jeremiah, to serve his people at a particular time in order to turn the people around. Um, but Jeremiah was called uh, to be, uh, to carry out even a longer uh, time of service than Josiah. Um, and it's unfortunate that Josiah had a son that uh, was evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, you know, it's such a blessing that God would turn around the kings in, in, in terms of inspiring Josiah and then to have a son who follows him but doesn't carry through is is perhaps one of the most disappointing things of scripture but nonetheless occurred and of course it refers these, these verses that refer to uh, the carrying away of Israel and that doesn't occur in Jeremiah until until um, Jeremiah 44 um, and, and of course uh, Jeremiah gets carried away himself um, but nonetheless, um, it's one of the saddest times in history that Israel was carried away into exile under the Babylonian captivity, but also according to God's will. And I hope that we, we em 
embraced last week the sermon that when, when God causes uh, tumultuous times, that it's God causing it, that he's the one doing it. It's not happening and he's surprised by it or, or that he's disturbed by it. It's his doing and it's for his purposes. And so we believe that Israel being carried away in exile was for his purposes. By the way, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. I'm yeah, I like how in your sermon how you said it's troubling. The Lord is troubling the world. <laughs> yeah, the Lord troubled them. Yeah, right? that's the phrase that he uses. And he, I was struck by that passage just in thinking about the troubling times that we live in in terms of city to city, that God troubles the cities. That, yeah. that these riots are not occurring and, and God is sitting idly by. He's troubling them. He's causing them. And to think about it that way is so new, um, honestly, to me. And, and I've loved how we've been able to study Joel and, and uh, Ecclesiastes and Job um, because in, in my thinking prior to what's been happening, I never thought of God causing things like that. Yeah. Um, but that's what he says. And uh, has anybody ever heard that preached or taught before? No. It's, it's a weird... It's a, the lack of that not being taught that strikes me. Because um, I don't know how else you read scripture. And that's exactly what it says. All right, uh, verse 4 and 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah had a personal encounter with the Lord. Um, he was raised in a godly, priestly home, and yet he had a personal encounter, a personal call by God. Uh, because many of his prophecies have echoes or hints of previous prophets, it seems that Jeremiah grew knowing God's word, Knowing his word, and, and that would mean Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Micah, all these he would know before. Um, Jeremiah was already a young man, but God wanted him to know that his call went back even further than his youth. You know, in, even in the womb. Um, this information wasn't just to interest Jeremiah or to entertain him, it was given that he would know God's will. He would be confident in God's will upon his life. And believe me when I say this to you, and I, I'm, I'm better, I, I'm more healed as an individual, um, but when I was early on in my ministry, I would constantly question whether I was called to do what I'm doing. I mean, it would be a, events would happen and I'd go, what am I doing? Why am I in this position? Who am I to do this job? Um, it, it would be a, a repeated questioning of my call. And as a minister, I'd have to go back to the church and I'd have to go, okay, they ordained me, so <laughs> that has to mean something. Um, but there's a repeated questioning of, golly, am I up to this? Should I be doing this? Have I been fooled by the devil in doing this and 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 this so this call of jeremiah to, to know the lord has called him was absolutely necessary especially with the pushback that he was going to be getting in his life um he would be constantly questioned as to whether he was actually giving the word of the lord or whether he was actually saying the opposite of what god is saying and it was necessary for him to know that god had called him from the womb and to know that had to push him forward um, to, to, to trust that he was doing what God had called him. Um, but I asked this question, and I know it's a... Can you say this about yourself? Did the Lord call you from your mother's womb? Before you were born, were you sanctified? Can you say this about yourself and your life? Can you say with the confidence of Jeremiah that the Lord formed you, the Lord knew you, the Lord sanctified you, the Lord ordained you? Can you say that? Yeah. I think you can have as much confidence as we do now. You know, with that, I mean, we don't really know. Sanctified, but who am I? I'm not, I don't, I don't 
really, they don't really have God's thoughts, so we can have just as much confidence as we do now as we do. Right. Yeah, I asked the question because I know it's a complicated answer. You should know that the Lord has ordained you. You're alive. <laughs> so God has chosen you to be alive. He's chosen you to be who you are. Uh, he's chosen you to do what you're doing. You can't, you couldn't do otherwise. You couldn't do otherwise or you wouldn't be here. However, and this is where I wanted to get to, uh, I want to show you how it's complicated. You're not called to be Jeremiah. I'm not called to be Jeremiah. There's just, just weird, <laughs> getting in my, my soapbox frustration. Um, you know how people, they quote Second Chronicles, what is it? Um, I can't remember. 49. What is it? 49. 49. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. And, and they, they, they throw this on social media. If only the United States would do this, then... <laughs> no! It's for Israel. It's not for us. It's, it's not. It's not. It's not for us. It's Israel. It's just like when people try to relate to David or Moses. Or, you, know, you and I are Jeremiah. You and I are Isaiah. We're not David. We're not Moses. Those are special people called for a special time, for a special moment to bring forth the kingdom of God. We're not to, we don't need to relate to them. You know, we are the, the people who need to serve the Lord in quietness. We're the, we're, the, we're the people that need to serve the Lord in our personal callings. We don't need to have a special calling. We don't need to have that. that that's neither of us. Um, we need to have a humility that we're, we're grateful that God is, that knows us. We're grateful that God um, has given us a, our own personality and our, our own personal situation. We don't need something big and special. Um, I, I, I preached years ago. I preached a sermon. I talked about um, how you're replaceable. And I got, some people came at me, just like personally just came at me, that you were wrong, just preaching that. And I know I wasn't wrong. And I'm not wrong today. I know that if I die today, someone's going to come along and take over this, this pastoral and do, you know, take, probably take it better than I've ever done. Um, we're all replaceable. Um, that's not a bad thing to say. Uh, it, it's true. And, and it, it's good to be humbled and, and to accept your own calling. You don't have to identify with Jeremiah in order to, to know that you're called of God. That's my point. And, uh, and we don't have to try to identify with Moses or Aaron or anybody. Um, we're all specially called for a unique situation, and that should be sufficient enough. All right. Um, it also says here, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And so Jeremiah, although he was specifically focused uh, on Judah, he also was a prophet that would speak to us today, which are the nations. Um a prophet to the world, yeah, that, that's a prophet to, to us today. All right, verses 6 through 10. Then I, then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces. For I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See that I see I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Ah, Lord, this translates an expression of deep feeling, a sense of, uh, of being hard on him to hear. Um, his excuse of being a youth means he's probably between 17 and, and 20 years of age. Um, you remember the protest of Moses? What was his protest? I have slow speech. Yeah, he was a good speaker. <laughs> and uh, now we find that... Uh, that uh, Jeremiah says he's too young. Um, and, and God says, do not say you're too young. Uh, the age is irrelevant. Um, 
I, I kind of struggle with this in the sense that um, I'm a better preacher, teacher, pastor today than I was when I first got here 21 years ago. So age does help. Maturity does help. But the point really is, isn't it, that he's anointed by God, and so that doesn't matter. God's anointed him for this time, this place. God has said this. Remember, he's, uh, Paul says to Timothy, do not let others look down on your youth. Um, if God has called you to this task, he's called you. Um, so even though I can look at myself and go, okay, I, I think I'm better than I was when I was younger, doesn't mean God didn't call me when I was younger. doesn't mean that God didn't put me in a place when I was younger. And, and so God has put him in this place. Um, we remember the number of different people that God had called. David was called as a young man. Um, John the Baptist was called as a young man. The Apostle Paul was a young man. Um, God has called many a people to, uh, to speak on his behalf as young men. For you shall go to all to whom I send. God spoke with both encouragement and persuasion. Um, Jeremiah later remembered his reluctancy, and he said in Jeremiah 17, Nor have I desired the woeful day. You know what came out of my lips. It was right there before you. He confessed to God how wrong he was uh, to reject the call. Um, Jeremiah had two reasons to be afraid, though. First, he was young, and second, that his message was hard to hear. His reluctance may have been based on the feeling of personal inadequacy when confronted with the almost hopeless task of recalling apostate Judah to a state of repentance. It's almost as if he was seeing the, the field out in front of him and realizing I'm not going to be received. I'm not going to be accepted. My message is not going to be heard. And yet I'm st still supposed to speak it. Uh, that's, a, that's a tough call to take. But the Lord said, I am with you, which was absolutely necessary. Um, not only will he send him among kings, he is going to uh, anoint him with the words of the Lord. And he would... Much like Moses, again, thinking about it like Moses, Moses coming before the Pharaoh and, and yet God was going to speak for him. Um, and notice how he says that he will touch his mouth. Remember what Isaiah said? Isaiah said, here I send me, but I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. I don't say the right things and I'm, I'm going to misspeak and, and yet here's God you know, calming that concern and telling him that he will indeed touch his mouth and say the right things. Um, let's see. See, I have, I have this day set you. Jeremiah was definitely called, and he was to remember this over his 40 years, that God had definitely called him. <clears throat> Especially, you can imagine, after Josiah died, how necessary it was to be reminded that God had called him. All right, verse 11 through 12. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. Jeremiah, what do you see? Um, Jeremiah would receive a message to speak. This is what this is the image he's supposed to bring before. Before you can make an impression upon another person's heart, you must have an impression upon your own. And God gives him that impression, a, a branch of an almond tree. Um, he not only stood that it was a branch, but was observant enough that it was a branch of an almond tree. Um, interestingly, Anathoth, the city from which he was from, um, remains to this day a center of almond growth. And modern visitors go there in early spring to see uh, the uh, almonds growing. Uh, the branch of an almond tree was important in two ways. First, the almond was well known as the first tree to bud in the spring. That's interesting. 
It indicated that God was ready to quickly fulfill his word, just as the almond tree seems ready to bud. Secondly, the Hebrew word for almond tree is close to and derived from the Hebrew, Hebrew word watchful. And this word is used in God's response to Jeremiah. These verses contain a play on the words that is lost in English, but is vital to the force of the vision. The almond tree is a segue to God saying, watch or be watchful. 13 through 16. And the word of the Lord came to me the second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot and it is facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, out of the north, calamity shall break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, says the Lord. They shall come and each one set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem against all its walls all around and against all the cities of Judah. I will utter my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness because they have forsaken me, burn incense to their other gods and worship the works of their own hands. Okay, so the boiling pot facing the north, uh, the idea of a boiling cauldron that will tip over with its openings facing the south. It's a vision of destruction, pouring out of destruction upon Jerusalem. Uh, the old Puritan commentator John Trapp showed how wrong the allegorical, allegorical approach to scripture can be describing the interpretation of an ancient writer named Gregory. Gregory, get into that. Um, man's mind is like a pot, which was what he was getting at. Um, let's see. As the gates of this city, uh, cities were in ordinary places where justice was administered, so the enemies of Jerusalem are here representing as conquering the whole land, assuming the reins of the government. Uh, the main reason for the coming judgment of Judah was chronic idolatry. Uh, that was their main sin, and of course, Josiah had to bring that down, or bring that to, to point, and then to, to call those uh, idolatrous practices uh, to uh, to judgment. Um, remember, of course, who's in the north when it comes to geography? What's the nation in the north? It was Assyria and then it was Babylon. Babylon. So the Babylonians are the ones that are coming uh, from the north. 17 through 19. Therefore, prepare yourself and arise and speak to them all that I command you. Do not be dismayed before their faces, lest I dismay you before them. For behold, I have made you this day a fortified city and an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes, against the priests, against the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. Now, this was a message that was to be given to the people to understand that God will fight for them only if they leave their idolatrous ways. Um, of course, the problem is that they did not. But this message has a twofold part to it. It's to Israel, to the people, that if they leave their ways, that God will fight for them. But it's also for Jeremiah himself to realize that even if the people don't listen to you, I will still be with you. I will still fight for you. And Jeremiah is going to face the reality that the people aren't going to listen to him. They're, they're not going to change their ways. And in fact, um, things are going to go south uh, for Israel eventually. And Jeremiah himself is going to go into exile. Um, things are going to fall apart. And I wonder how much that message uh, sits for us as we face uh, changes uh, of the wind in terms of elections. Uh, we feel like things might go south for us. <laughs> things might go against us. Um, but the Lord wants us to know that he will fight for us, that he will prevail, that he has a purpose, uh, and that none of it goes beyond his plans of, of salvation. I couldn't help but connect the, these passages with what we're studying in Ephesians uh, for Wednesday, because um, it's all about the Lord's plan. It's all about the Lord's uh, schedule of what he is, is uh, ordained and, and predestined to happen. Um, the same thing that he's predestined for Jeremiah, he's predestined for us, and it's a, it's a plan of salvation that can't be thwarted 
and we're to trust in it no matter what our situation, what our circumstances are. Any questions for this? Um, I was just thinking, you know, we talk about these metaphors of moving east to west, west to east. Mm -hmm. Anything about judgment and it always, and primarily it's because of the nations were stronger north in terms of when the judgment of the Lord came and yeah. taking Israel and Judah. But anything to the idea of, he talks, he emphasized coming from the north. Um, anything to that? Yeah, the only, I, I don't have an answer for that other than I remember our study of Joel he talked about. The prophet Joel had that reference to the north. And I remember reading um, uh, commentators about how strange that was for them because he talked about, Joel talks about the, the um, weather, the catastrophic, catastrophic weather coming from the west, I mean coming from the north. And the commentators say, well, nobody comes from the west. That's, 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 where, right. that's where the weather, catastrophic weather comes from. Why would they say the north? Right. And so that curiosity about why the north, other than it's simply referring to nations that are stronger, um, and of course Assyria was, and then Babylon were the stronger nations, although Egypt is from the south. Yeah. So a northern approach is it is a curious I don't know the answer to that I was just thinking I was just thinking of uh, I remember when the tribes were allotted the lands and Dan went to the north and how there was special attention to Dan mm -hmm. um, making sure that they would be ready for things that were coming to them yeah because they're over the northern so far away yeah as well it's just interesting it's just curious it is curious because in the only surviving nations at this time were the southern ones because the northern ones had already been taken by exactly. Assyria prior to that. Yeah. So, south, north, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry, I missed that Jeopardy question. That's all right. Anybody else? <laughs>